it seems like we're just at such major extremes. It, 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 I don't remember a time where we had this big of a difference. Maybe 2007 was the last time, but is that what we're actually saying here? Are we saying this is like 2007 all over again, where there's some monster lurking beneath the surface that the bond market has teased out that the stock market doesn't see yet? And so you can understand the regular person, the regular investor's concern. It's like, what the hell do I, how do I make sense of all of these different messages? It's one thing, you know, like you said, it's a complex marketplace, but this is just nuts. This is just insane at this point. Yeah, and and, and so, you know, to, to the real folk back home trying to make sense of the, the nutty house, again, I, yeah, I'd, I'd come back again to, um, you what a hedge fund, what a macro hedge fund, global macro hedge fund does is it, it per- pursues diversification across that chart. So, you know, it 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 is constantly uh, got bums on seats in different parts of of the cathedral, if you will. You know, um, last year and continuing into this year, uh, my where I've wanted to take risk within that that one hundred percent has been in in the long end of the treasury market, um, and that's been a function of like. Where prices reset, where the where they're rebounding from, you know, we we took out all of the price bull market of the U.S. Treasury bond market from I want to say from two thousand and five. We took out nineteen years of of price, not yield. You know, you, you got income from it, but all of the price was was given back. Um, and so, you know, to to quote to uh, to quote Emil and. Uh, it's so exciting that his silent depression, I think, is is gaining gaining currency. But the the fifteen years or so of the silent depression, and we've taken out all the price gains of the the fixed income market, and I'm I'm intrigued about that. And so, if, if I want to kind of uh, uh, take issue with the market, and I want to when I want to take issue with the market, I want prices to be on my side, if you will. And so, the kind of that profound mean reversion. Uh, has instilled in me a kind of you know a, a risk-taking kind of bravado, and so that's been my biggest uh, position. But I think Jeff, so the the thing that always brings me back uh, to your wisdom is that, and and where where we differ from market prices is in I think in our mental robustness in in fighting off the propaganda of the Federal Reserve. You know that they, they've done a, an incredible job. That they're in control. Yeah, that they, these are their interest rates. This is this is their manner. You know, uh, markets do what they tell them to do. Yeah, and, and and so and everyone, you know. So the the perplexing thing for me is uh, people gnaw their their teeth and and they say the disgrace of the of we've had the fifteen years of. Uh, incredibly low uh, short-end interest rates and, and indeed across the whole spectrum uh, of duration. That, that somehow that, that was by a bureaucratic uh, uh, intervention. And, and of course, it's got nothing, it's nothing of the sort. You know, uh, and there are many clues. And again, the the currency is the clue. The the, the damn currency is appreciated over that period. I mean, that, there there you go. So like, shut up. And yet, the mainstay opinion is that you know the the corruption of the United States, the corruption of this wonderful citadel of entrepreneurialism, innovation, um, is that all of these entrepreneurs one by one um, are being are being transformed into speculators and and, and betting on asset prices. Uh, at the behest of the Federal Reserve, um, and that's that's not the case. That those interest rates are there, have been there for wider global factors, and and the thing that kind of changed my perspective when I hung up my hedge fund boots in 2017, I kind of did a lot of I tried tried to do a lot of work catching up with the role of China because you know we we keep hinting at elephants in the room and um, and. On the one hand, you, uh, and, you know, a tale of two cities. Typically, it's it's the Chinese economy and it's rampant, and it's the uh, you know the the U.S. just can't get out of first gear. And of course, presently, China's kind of chugging is really is really stuck. And like you say, three point three uh, again, U.S. Uh, that that the final quarter GDP coming in way ahead of expectations. But uh, there has been a profound tectonic-like shift in 
the manner of global economics over the course of the last 30 years. Um, and global economics is, everything is determined at the margin and it's determined by international trade, by uh, how continents respond, engage with each other. And ever since the Asian tiger crisis of 1997, uh, you've had a pivot led by the Chinese whereby their industrialization has been financed internally, which is very much uh, the opposite of 250 years of international trade. Like when the US was having its China moment in the 18th, 19th century, um, it was very much being financed. Uh, it was running deficits and it was, it was being financed by the surplus savings of the international community. That is not the case. And, and so China actually, um, that there's a whole myriad of operations and gears and you know, shift changes, but um, it tends to create an enormous pump of liquidity into dollar assets. Um, and if there is a, a malignant force at work in the universe of, of establishing proper price and risk uh, levels, I would say it's this very, very peculiar form of, of trade, principally between the US and, and China, but I mean, really between China and the rest of the world. Yeah, there's definitely the dragon in the room here. And maybe that's part of the answer that we're searching for, which is that there are bigger forces, bigger structural forces at work that we can't quite get our hands on. You know, we spent 40 some odd years building a world that we thought was going to be permanent. Certainly the Chinese thought it was going to be permanent. And so did many people. I mean, how many people around the West thought that China was becoming more neoliberal and joining the international club and all that. And the Chinese were just biding their time, waiting for how things were going to turn out. And then over this last 15 years of Emile's silent depression, he did he, a wonderful term there. Over the last 15 years of Emile's silent depression, very slowly, very gradually, the gears have sh haven't just shifted, they've wound backward. And so the Chinese have to deal with the structural elements of that reversal, that massive global reversal. We have to deal with it in certain respects too. The Europeans have to, the emerging markets all have to deal with it. And it's always there underneath the surface. And we don't really know how this is going to play out in the end. We don't know what the world is going to look like in 10 years because these massive forces haven't really been, they haven't really matured enough that we can put a finger on it and say, this is what China's going to be like in 10 years. I mean, the Chinese are trying to do what they're trying to do to, to get to that 10 year point. They think they're going to create the fourth industrial revolution and turn China into the next powerhouse when that's a dubious proposition. But we really don't know how everything is going to shake out over the long run. And so I think I, I wonder if that's a big theme, not not just in the macro thinking, you know, the, the, the fools of uh, us fools that are up on YouTube talking about this stuff all the time. But how much of that is maybe an investment theme too? people who, as you said, people that are hedging in the marketplace, they're not doing it because they have these long range forecasts and they have a feeling about something 10 years from now. They have commercial pressures that they're responding to. And so are we seeing those commercial pressures somewhat related to some of these longer run structural shifts? That's the question yeah. I have. Yeah, no, well, indeed. Um, I mean, I, I, I liken the, the run-up in Chinese property uh, to kind of like that last hurrah in the Dow Jones in the 1920s, 1927 to 29. Um, I mean, the, the high-tech mark in, in Chinese real estate was like 60 trillion US dollars in the context of the, the economy nominal dollar terms kind of peaked out around about, I think, $18 trillion, and it's kind of struggling at that level just now. I mean, it's, a, it's just the most preposterous level, and it's, and it's how you... The, the, the issue they're trying to solve just now is how you deal with the, the devaluation in that property. And many people say that, given their system, that they, they have... Do they have extra levers? I don't think so. But you know, uh, the great fear, the, the the dragon fear, is that it is kind of. You could imagine how they could be persuaded to believe it's easier to devalue that the sixty trillion is unsustainable. I mean, it's coming coming back, yeah. And it'd be but it'd be easier to to devalue property in dollar terms rather than in one terms. 
Um, and that and that's why our focus continues to be on that. Uh, you know, I, I Juan and Remimbi, I call it red cabbage, which I don't know is facetious, but the, the you, you need what seven point two or so red cabbages uh, to buy a dollar. Uh, and again, the kind of the machinations of the of of the universe of international trade, and I think where there's where, where it hasn't worked properly. Um, I, I believe that if that market had been properly functioning, that you would perhaps only need four and a half red cabbages to buy one US dollar, which is to say uh, that the Japanese private sector would be considerably richer vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, and we wouldn't have a, a deficiency of demand and a surplus of savings, which distorts uh, the price and the accuracy of, of, of risk levels and, and risk determination. So again, it all comes back to the dragon's ass, if you will. I wrote a paper in November, uh, the positive void coefficient, which was the term given to the particular state of affairs uh, with the tragedy of the meltdown in the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl in Ukraine uh, many years back. And... and, and Several things were revealed which I thought could present themselves as a metaphor for the environment of finance today and in particular the engagement of the Federal Reserve. I, I think of the Federal Reserve and, and there's, there's been a wonderful kind of fictional television series made about the events surrounding Chernobyl. Um, and you see these diligent, albeit kind of communist guys smoking cigarettes and like, you know, they're, they're touching a control control panel, but you're studious and, oh, and they're involved, they're engaged. Um, and and they're they're trying to control this this beast, you know, and the and the chaos of course which is going on below the surface, they're really not aware of. And there's so, and so if you will, the, there's a conceit and an arrogance that there's an, an operating procedure and that they know what to do. And doesn't that sound like the Federal Reserve? Like, hey, we got this, yeah. We know what to do. We're going to press this button. We're going to send you another acronym and we're going to s save, the, save the world. So there's that going on, if you will, the, the, the arrogance. You know what, Hugh, when, when, you, when you brought that up, I, I thought the same thing. You know, I thought that was a really good analogy because I, I don't know if people realize this, that Chernobyl actually, all four of their reactors had accidents. It was only the last one that was the big one. And so it was the same thing. The, they had a reactor incident, I think it was number two. It was a relatively serious one in 82, I think it was. And, you know, they, the same, it was just like the Fed. They came and said, oh, we learned from the mistake. It wasn't that big of a deal. We've, we've got new tools and new acronyms and new procedures. We know what we're going to do next time. And then, oh, reactor number one has an accident. And they come back and say, oh, we've got new tools and new procedures. And then... Reactor number four, which was the big one, just absolutely blew everything. But it, yeah, I thought that was a really good analogy. Yeah. So the so another thing that came from it were, were the, the secrets and the omissions, if you will. Like what the operators didn't know. You know, because I'm not saying that the operators are, are, are simply just arrogant. You know, they're, they're, they're trying their best in a, in a world of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, but what was revealed was so that... You've, you've got nu nuclear, is it fusion, is it, you know, like you're creating energy uh, and you're trying to control this thing. If you, if you was like a, you're making soup or you're, you're, you've got this bubbling soup in a pot, the pot is the reactor, is the plant, and you've got knobs like your cooker and you can turn it up and you can turn it down, yeah? And, and the knob in a nuclear power station is a control rod and, and you can pu push it down and that will slow things down. Now... Uh, and that's just like the Federal Reserve. Apparently, they have interest rates, and they can deviate those rates from the natural rate uh, for a periodic kind of. In hey, Mr. Market, do I have your attention? I'm kind of messing with you, but I'm not going to mess with you too long because I know who will win. I mean, they don't tell you that, but you know, there's a you know that that's um, that's hidden. Uh, but what came out in the subsequent reports was that the control rods in Chernobyl were deficient. They weren't, they weren't the regulated size, and so they, they couldn't actually go all the way into the soup, if you will. And, and so their reaction function was compromised. And I think there's very definitely 
an analogy there with the fact that um, there was a remarkable period in 2020, stretching to the end of 2021, where the private sector went, whoa, let's refinance risk. You know, like you can refinance 30 year mortgages and you, you know, and if you, most, just about everyone got it and everyone refinanced. And, and so the Fed came late and it's putting its control rod in. It's like, hey, watch this, we're raising interest rates. But 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 nothing. The, the the thing's still heating up, and it's like this doesn't make sense. Like what was happening? And the control rod is inefficient because there'd been a profound change. There'd been a refinancing. So that's going on. The second thing that came to the fold was that um, the what is the, t- the the coolant that they were using was uh, a I want I may be making this up. I want to say it was a graphite coolant and. But they were. It was in a, a gra- graphite coolant, and then it was mixing with with hot air. And apparently, that combination is such that it's a bit like a brake, where you you hit the brake, but you ex- initially you accelerate because there's a there's a really bad engagement initially. So there's a quirk before it before it comes in, and so it does the opposite, and and so. And you and you're seeing again. You're seeing that with 3.3 GDP growth in the last quarter, with the 5.2 in the third quarter. You're like, oh my, this is accelerating, but but it's going to slow down. Uh, and then and then really finally, uh, the malignancy, which is clearly not evident stateside, but the malignancy is that um, that Chinese response to the emergence of the silent depression in 2008. You know, I mean, to my mind, China was persuaded by its international peer group. It, there was a London conference of the G10 or whatever in, in 2008 by the Premier Gordon Brown. And, and, and China saw as an opportunity to take global leadership and say, we will be the bridge. There is a deficiency of demand and we're gonna be the bridge from, from today's difficulties to, to a brighter future, we're going to spend a great deal. We are going to lay down the productive capacity that will support the world. Which world? The world of the GDP expansion of the last 30 years to that point in 2008. So the continuation of that, the continuation of that in today's world, well, it didn't happen. We're missing literally trillions and trillions of dollars because that did not happen. And so the munificence, if you will, of that Chinese reaction in 2008 has saddled the world with this profound um, source of uh, overcapacity. And each year it's just been added to. And so um, paradoxically, in this world where the S&P is at this all time high, my biggest fear is is one of of an, another really profoundly scary uh, deflationary event. You know, so for me just now, this is like two thousand eleven. Ch- you know, Ch- China is going through the European sovereign crisis, except China is going through the the repercussions of of allowing a profound monstrous bubble in in its principal property asset market bar- uh, market uh, property, um, and. I, you know, all eyes on on the red cabbage, on the remimbi. If the remimbi blows, if if it blows, is is Mad Max. Um, and so that's again why I'm not short equities, but I'm kind of like fifteen to twenty percent long equities. I'm really long, kind of you know the TLTs. Um, I play around a little bit with with Bitcoin because I just think the absolute size designation of that market. It means. Uh, is it even a trillion dollar market today in the context of gold which is almost 15 trillion in the context of US equities which are I don't know 55 60 trillion if not more trillion dollars so that that's kind of where I am just as I'm I'm kind of um I'm 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 a narcissistic absurdist fantasist um <laughs> and, and I'm conservative yeah well, I think the thing that you just said, I think that is one of the most profound parts of all of this is that the Chinese blew a bubble that wasn't just a bubble for China. It was essentially this housing bubble that suppo- was supposed to rescue the world 
in 2009 and 10 and moving forward. And so in many ways, in many respects, China's housing bubble is our bubble. We are related to it. A lot of stuff uh, was was built off of China building these bubbles. You know, we, that was around the time we started hearing about the ghost cities in China. Well, th those were our ghost cities. You know, if you're someone living in a resource rich country like Australia, a lot of the iron that was mined in Australia went to build this gold city. And so there are global ramifications as well as financial ones, too, that spread around the rest of the world. And as you know, just listening to you talk and go through it from the perspective of investor, I get you get the same sense that, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, the bifurcation, of the marketplace, the, the dark feelings people are worried about. It makes sense that they would look at China saying a China going through a 2011 European sovereign debt crisis would not have 2011 and 2012 implications for the world. It would be much more. It would be much bigger than that. So if China is indeed going through something like its own reckoning with its imbalances that were built up over the last decade, the downside to that isn't, you know, OK, some a little bit of a recession in Europe. It's the downside to that is emerging markets really get smashed. China itself, I mean, which is a political unstable uh, place anyway. And the spillover in financial terms is going to make sure that the rest of the world actually feels the pain, too. This is not something that's going to be localized just to Beijing or the top tier cities in China. It's going to it's going to have both short run and long run ramifications around everywhere. The problem is we can't put a clock on it. We can't say, OK, this is going to happen. And the primary counter argument is always, well, people have been concerned about China's property market for a decade and it's still there. It's this recency bias. Um, China's doing, you know, they're not doing great, but at least they're still they're still chugging along here. So are we just waiting for nothing? Is this all just conjecture and the Chinese will find a way to sort it out? And this is what brings me back to your analogy with the, the positive void coefficient, because much of that belief that the Chinese are going to sort it out and everything will be just fine rests upon basically technocrats saying, well, we have enough understanding, we have enough information, we have enough knowledge and wisdom that we'll be able to push the right buttons at the right time to sort of let the air out of China's bubble just slowly enough that it comes off, but not so fast that it gets into this disorderly case that I think the marketplace is really more and more concerned about. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, in that, that paper, I, I also kind of, I mean, paper was a thread on Twitter, but... Um, <laughs> the, it, so another is that any different in an academic journal? An academic journal is a, is the uh, academics version of, of Twitter. <laughs> no, but you know, the, one, one of the charges is uh, perma bear. Oh, you got like you say, you know, like oh, you're always oh yeah. Um, yep. But it, it can it's tantalizing because it can cut both ways. So um, I was, and it's damn complex. Um, but if you, I liken what China has successfully accomplished, you know, it's profound industrial, it, it has a, an amazing economy, you know, the infrastructure it has way too much overcapacity and it, it keeps adding to it. But, you know, it's, it's wonderful capacity. It's just underutilized uh, and, it, and it's putting enormous burdens on the capacity of the rest of the world to relent. Um, but... The financing of that, again, came from internal means, which, and it wasn't necessary that they pursue that path. And, and really, the only other country that, that pursued that path, because they didn't really have much choice, was, uh, was, was the, the Soviet era. You know, it, it was the industrialization of Russia in, the, in Stalin's industrialization in the 1930s. And he was, he was trading the, the breadbasket of Ukraine, effectively. Uh, he was exporting, you know, grains for the, the, the industrial know-how of Nazi, what became Nazi Germany. And, and you had this great, the great, so there was a wealth transfer, which was essentially, you know, the, the empty stomachs of uh, the citizens, citizenship of, uh, of Russia. And, and there was a, a profound famine in there, like millions of people died. Uh, but but Russia did achieve industrialization. Now, thankfully, it's been nothing as horrific as that in in modern times with China. But there has been a, a wealth dis di displacement, 
and it's been the regular Chinese Joe. You know, he's not had a real return on financial products. You know, the stock market's been on its ass like forever. Uh, if he puts money in deposit at a bank, he gets nothing. He, it's really disgraceful what he gets. He gets he, he's subsidizing the bank. You know, he's, he's accepting negative real rates. Um, he, he has brought profound surge in productivity from from being brave to move or, or like with a whip being being uh, manhandled from the countryside to these great metropolises. Um, he's been, uh, he earns a salary which would be the envy of his predecessors, but it is not where it should be vis-a-vis the, the bargaining of what he brings, his productivity has brought. He, he accepts less, is what I'm saying. He accepts less. And then finally, like I say, his currency should be way, way, way stronger vis-a-vis the rest of the world. Uh, and yet it's not. So that's the empty stomach, if you will. And we can actually put money, monetary terms around that. So let's say China is $18 trillion. Uh, a modern economy like China, consumption, private sector consumption, you know, not the government. Sometimes they put government in there, but private sector consumption should be like 65% of GDP. So it should have like a six handle, six trillion handle, but it's not, it's three. And if you account for that, like where it is versus where it would be without this dead hand, this bureaucratic kind of decision to fund internally, um, and you put that into perpetuity with a with a growth model. So, like you you say that 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 consumption would likely grow in perpetuity at two two percent. Let's say that's a three hundred trillion dollar deficiency of demand. Like if China wasn't pursuing this course of international trade, its citizenship would be way richer, and their demand would be greater. And in terms of putting a present value on it, you'd be it would be three times global GDP. Right? Now, so imagine it exi- a, a parallel universe where they took that path. Then, you know, German manufacturers, US manufacturers, indeed, the great sacrifice that Bill Clinton, the US president, accepted on behalf of the citizens of, you know, uh, Illinois and Detroit and, and all the rest was, hey, listen, folks, it's going to be really, really, really tough on you and your community. We're going to stand by you. We'll, be, we'll try and give you, uh, you know, transfer payments. But I'm telling you, like, by 2024, we're going to have this huge, hugely uh, rich nation and they're going to buy, like, all of our merchandise. And they failed us on that. Okay, and they failed us to the tune of three times global GDP. So what's happened is that three times GDP is being displaced. It could it could live within us in terms of higher incomes, higher productivity, higher levels of investment, higher like just a, a more wonderful life, no silent depression. And it doesn't exist. And instead, if you will, it's like Mount. Uh, Mont Blanc in Switzerland, and it's just, it's being dumped into the lake of the stock market. And so we look around ourselves, and it's not just stocks, it's, it's property. You go to dinner parties and everyone's kind of bragging about where they're making money in asset prices. And that's all a function of this um, mercantilism is a, is a term we use. But it's damn complicated, and we could do things to change it, but the, the power the, 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 the levers of power are typically is money controls power. Where's the money? The money is Wall Street. Who are the biggest contributors to, you know, to Washington? It's Wall Street. And Wall Street, the status quo just means, well, where's, where's the S&P? High, 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 baby, and it's getting higher, you know? So no one's voting for it. And so we're stuck with this damn world, but it's it's a world which will implode on itself because it's a world which is profoundly deflationary. There's such a huge imbalance there. I I would call it financialism more than mercantilism. Um, And that was the grand bargain. And I don't know know if it was an ad hoc kind of thing or if it just kind of naturally sort of sprung out from the conditions of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. But you're right. We traded industrial capacity in the West not for increased appetite and demand from the east 
we traded it for, we, we basically replaced, and I grew up in the Rust Belt, so I saw it firsthand. Uh, it's, it started in the 70s and 80s, and you could, you know, I remember in high school, friends of mine, you know, their fathers would be, you know, thrown out of work because they worked at the local plant, and that got moved someplace in the east. Um, and that was supposed to be, as you said, that was supposed to be replaced by global prosperity, and instead it all went into banking. It all went into balance sheet capacity. It all went into financialism to the point that in the, the silent depression, to me, what the most pernicious aspect of it has been is that it removed the economic growth upside to all of these big, big picture trends and just left us with the financialism. That's like the only avenue that we have available. And it's like a black hole vortex that sucks up all the productive capacity. Because as you said, Hugh, if you want to make money, do you make money in the real economy? Nah, the real economy sucks. I'm going to go start trading derivatives, which is unproductive as hell. <laughs> Not that there isn't a place for derivatives, but if we have more smart people doing real economy things, the real economy is going to benefit. But if the real economy can't get out of its own way, people are quite naturally, like you and I, we're going to be attracted to the financialism. And that plays back into your overriding, you know, the positive, uh, co positive void coefficient, the Federal Reserve, from the perspective of just most people, the real economy sucks, it's dangerous, it's full of crap. When you got these overriding technocratic, uh, you know, these overlords, the Federal Reserve that can fix all, you know, they can make sure everything's fine, stock markets only go higher, it seems quite, it, it seems almost intuitive that that's where the center of gravity and the entire freaking global system would shift in that direction. Meanwhile, the economy suffers, but yet markets do, markets, some markets anyway, they flourish. And then we're stuck trying to figure out how the hell do we make sense of the economy doesn't do well, but yet the stock market's doing really well, and all of our productive capital moves into the financial sphere. And I'm where you are, Hugh. You wonder how long can this continue? How long can we continue to keep the lights on and everything moving forward with this such a profound, big picture, big uh, long-term imbalance that only gets worse through time, even if the U.S. GDP was 3% in the fourth quarter? As Hugh said, we have to navigate a matrix of red and blue pills. We want to see more of the principles of the madhouse from Mr. Hugh Hendry and myself. And we talk for over an hour. The rest of our conversation is available for Eurodollar University members and subscribers. And if you are willing to become one, not just to get the rest of the conversation with Hugh, we've got other conversations. Brent Johnson, Macro Elf, Mike Green, Jim Rickards, the background behind LTCM, and others that are coming along the way. But Eurodollar University memberships are not just about our conversations with other special guests. There's over 75 hours of content on the background behind the Eurodollar system. What money is? There's a basic series going over that. How to read money and bond curves, as well as classroom videos. We get into the nitty gritty details, diagramming how this monetary system fits together, how it's supposed to work and several reasons why it may not be working. There's also research subscriptions, a daily deep dive analysis, a daily briefing that we put together, what's happening in our world and why it may, ha may be happening and why it all matters. When you put it all together, as you're able to do in this unadvertised sale that we're running here, the link in the description, you get the daily briefing, the daily deep dive analysis, plus access to the Eurodollar University membership site, all for one incredibly low price. Conversations, classroom materials, Q&As, weekly recaps, and on and on and on. Plus, with the research subscriptions, you get, to, you get a sense of what's happening today and why it actually matters. As I said, all of that's available there's an unadvertised sale link in this description. And I cannot thank Hugh Hendry enough for joining me. It's always interesting and fun to get together with Hugh. Again, thanks, Hugh, for joining me. Check him out, Acid Capitalist, and all of the stuff that he has available. And I hope to see you at the Eurodollar University membership site.